Hey guys, today we're going to be talking about the Megacell Charger from MegacellCharger.com. They are currently running a crowdfunding campaign to fund mass production of this charger. I reached out to them and asked a few questions about testing, and they generously provided me with this charger to review and do some testing on. And most of my testing will be durability testing to see how long this charger has lasted after thousands and thousands of cells, in addition to providing feedback from somebody who is constantly processing large quantities of cells. So I think the best way to begin is just to give you an overview of this charger, and then I will take you through the firmware setup and connecting it to the access point, and then show you a little bit in the back end with the software. So I'm going to go ahead and get these cells out and I'll show you a closer look. So I've been using this charger for a couple days now, and I just wanted to get a good feel for how it works. So there are 16 separate slots, each one will operate independently. For the cell holders, they are the two cell surface mount holders, with higher quality retaining tabs as opposed to springs. I do like this design a lot better than simply putting a four cell holder on here because when there are cells in the adjoining slots here, there is enough room to stick your finger in so you can get them out, whereas if the four cell holders were in here, they'd be four cells close together and it would be more difficult to remove individual cells. The charger uses 5 volts DC. The manual does say to use a 16 amp minimum power supply. I started with this old Dell power supply that's rated for 22 amps max. And I had two of these power supplies, and both times the charger blew this power supply, even though it's rated at 22 amps, when it tried to charge all 16 cells at once. So if you have something better available, I would certainly recommend more than 22 amps. The power supply I'm using currently is rated for 40 amps on the 5 volt rail, and it's been working flawlessly since. On the back, you'll see the charger is equipped with two large fans, which will provide cooling during charging and discharging. The fans only turn on when the charger is getting hot. This charger has some great protections built in as well. Every slot has its own temperature sensor, and the software will shut off charging and discharging functions if this temperature sensor exceeds the preset threshold, and that threshold is configurable from within the software. In the center of the board, we have the Wi-Fi chip, and we also have the display. This can be operated without the computer software, however, it is much easier to use the computer software, and certain functions won't be usable without the computer software, which we'll go over shortly. Again, on the back, we have the power connector. They are Phillips screw terminal blocks. Um, I wired three wires to each one. These are 18 gauge wires, so one 18 gauge wire is not enough to supply the 20 amps required by this charger. So I have three strands going into this connection block. These screws do feel like they're going to strip out uh, fairly easily, so just be careful when you're tightening those down. And then one thing we complain about most often with the Opus is having to replace the fans. Um, so as you'll see, these fans are very easy to replace. There's just two Phillips screws in the back that hold this in, and then just a standard two pin connector on the board. And last but not least, we have a micro USB port in the front for updating the firmware. And if you look on the side, you'll see the heatsink for each channel. Air is pulled in through both sides of the fan shroud. The fan shroud is 3D printed, but I believe part of their funding campaign is to have a plastic cover that will go over the entire board based on injection molding that will not require 3D printing. So on the bottom side, you'll see the 3D printed cover extends to the base of the board. That just provides even pressure distribution when you're putting cells in and taking them out. That way the board's not going to warp. One thing I did find interesting, though, is that the discharge resistors are on the bottom of the circuit board. You'll see they are nice thick resistors as opposed to the little tiny ones we see in other chargers, such as the Opus. However, that does make me wonder, though, why the heat sinks are on the top of the board. So I guess they're relying on heat from these resistors being transferred through the board into the heat sink on the other side. Uh, I'm not quite sure, because if I put my finger on these resistors while it's discharging, they do feel very hot. So, as I mentioned, one of the first things you want to do before you start using your charger is to update the firmware. So make sure you have power applied to the input, uh, 5 volts DC. You don't want any cells in the charger at this point. And then you'll just need a standard micro USB charger like you use for your phone. Plug it in here. And then in a USB port of your choice. So at this point, I'm going to switch over to the computer and we'll go over the software installation there. So on the downloads page for Megacell Monitor, I'll post a link to all the references here in the description below. Anyway, on the Megacell Monitor website on the downloads page, you will need the Flash Utility. So I just download that. It's Node MCU. And then you'll also want to grab the latest firmware release. The latest release at the point of this video is 2.0.26. Once the software finishes downloading, double click Node MCU to launch. Under the serial port drop down menu, you should see a new device listed. If you're not sure which port to use, you can open the device manager and then expand the ports where it says COM and LPT. And you should see one that says USB to serial CH340. Again, for me, I only have one and it is port COM5. 
For the firmware, you'll click Browse and locate the bin file we just downloaded. You want the baud rate set to 115,200. You want the flash mode set to dual I.O. And you need Erase Flash set to No. It's very important that you click Erase Flash set to No. If you click Yes, it will wipe your charger. So we're going to double check we have the settings set correctly, all three of them, and then click Flash. And once that's complete, it should say Firmware Successfully Loaded. So we will close out the application. So next you want to get this board connected to your Wi-Fi. When you turn it on for the first time, you'll see it says Starting Wi-Fi. And then it's going to search for WPA. If your router supports WPA, you can use a little button on the back of the router to enable WPA. And once the timer is up, uh, the device will be running in access point mode. That means this device is now broadcasting an access point. Uh, so you can see the name of the access point there, along with the password to connect to the access point. So on your computer, you want to disconnect from anything that you may be connected to. And then wait a few seconds and you should see the Cell Doctor access point appear. So click Connect. So once the Configure Wi-Fi page appears, you can click Configure Wi-Fi. And you should see your access point name at the top. Just click on that. Uh, the SSID is case sensitive, so make sure the case does match the name of your access point and then type in your access point password and click save. And on the display of the charger you'll see it's rebooting and then when it boots up it should say connected and show the IP address. So when you install the software for the first time it will prompt you to enter a license key. You'll have to enter your email address and then they will manually approve the license and send you a .lic file. Once you receive that .lic file it goes under the C drive in the connect and exchange folder and you'll just paste that file right in that folder. Um, you'll see the original hardware ID that was sent to them to approve the license. So that license is going to be specific to that hardware ID. Once you have that set up, you can open the application. So the first thing I usually do is click Select All. I make sure I have Advanced Mode enabled. And then I also have this icon on the bottom right set to Cell Data Overview, which will open this grid panel that you just saw pop up while I was talking. So the button options we have from left to right, we have Charge, Discharge, Capacity Test, Storage Charge, and Cancel. On the bottom row we have Settings, Database, Workflow. This button will toggle between Simple and Expert Mode, and then this button will toggle the displays that are available. The first tab is where you will configure any database settings you want. Unfortunately, it looks like the only database options are SQLite, which is stored in your local hard drive, and SQL Server, which under charger settings, you'll see any chargers you have. You can manage any number of chargers. I just have one at this point. Um, and when you click on the charger, it will open the values on the right panel. For my particular charger, I have the min voltage set to 2.8, the store voltage and the max voltage set to 4.25. Before you panic and say, oh, that's over 4.20 volts, I will explain this value in a little bit. My max discharge is set to 1000, and my temperature cutoff is set to 40, and I only want to do one discharge cycle. I unchecked the chip controlled charging because I don't like the way the chip charges the cells. On the new cell insert actions tab, this is where you define the workflow that you want for your cell. For my particular charger, the only thing I'm doing is capacity testing. But you can set up any particular workflow you want in here. There is low voltage recovery, like if you're charging, trying to recover cells that are 0 volts or 0.1 volt or something like that. There is timers if you want to have a timer between charge and discharge. There is label printing. You can actually connect a Dymo label printer thermal printer to your computer and then you can have it automatically print out a barcode label with the capacity that you can then stick on your cell when you're done. I don't really know what the lifespan of thermal labels is but I know the thermal labels are not intended to be long term so I'm going to stick with just manually writing the capacities on the cells with the marker for now. Uh, there's some stuff under the circuit breaker tab this determines when it cuts off a cell. I'm not really too sure what some of these settings mean so I'm not going to say too much on that for now. So as I mentioned, my new cell insert actions is only set to capacity test. Uh, so what I want to do now is you want to click select all from this drop down, and that will check all these boxes, which is all the slots on your charger. Uh, or if you have multiple chargers, it'll check all the boxes across all of the chargers. And I'm going to click the workflow button to enable the workflow. And the reason why I'm using the workflow instead of the capacity test is I want the charger to know what I want to do as soon as I put the slot in. I don't want to have to come back and check the individual cell and click capacity test each time. When I put a new cell in, I want it to automatically begin the capacity test. And after I click that button, you'll see in the pane, the left pane over here, the status turn to start new workflow. Now one thing that caught me up quite a bit when I was doing this originally is I didn't know there was a delay between when you click these buttons and when statuses change. If you click one of these buttons and nothing happens, you should probably wait about five or six seconds before the change actually takes effect. 
Um, I believe that's just the latency between when the application requests data from the charger versus when it's sending data. So once all slots are in the start new workflow state, we can come back over to the charger and load it up with cells. So we got 16 cells in. That is the same equivalency of, a, of having four individual Opus chargers. Back on the computer screen over here, you'll see they changed from new cell inserted and then it automatically began the workflow. So the status is now capacity test started charging. Uh, they call it the MCAP test. The way the MCAP works is it will charge it up to your predefined voltage, it will discharge it down to your set voltage, and then charge it back up to your store voltage. So I mentioned earlier I'll explain why I have mine set to 4.25 volts. I've noticed with this particular charger that, that it doesn't regulate the amps the way it should near the end of the charging cycle. So what will happen is this volts will climb until it reaches 4.2 volts and then instead of throttling down the amps and holding the constant voltage like it's supposed to until the amps reaches a preset threshold, the charger immediately stops as soon as it hits the 4.2 volts. Now the problem with that is that the cell's not really at 4.2 volts because that's not accounting for the loss in the traces. It's not doing the constant voltage charge at the end like it should. So I found by setting the charger to 4.25 volts, as soon as the charging voltage hits 4.25, the charger immediately shuts off and then the resting voltage of the cell goes down to anywhere from 4.17 to 4.20. So I don't want to tell anybody to charge their cells up to that high of a voltage because again, you should never charge it past 4.2. I have checked about 100 cells so far using this method. I haven't pulled a single cell out that was above 4.20 volts. So I know that method is working for me. Again, that is for me. You need to configure your own charger in a safe manner and a safe manner is never to charge a cell above 4.2 volts. Now, the other reason why I'm doing that is because Many of us are taking these cells afterwards and they let them sit for two to three weeks or four weeks or even more. And then we'll check the voltage of the cell and see what the voltage drop has been. That test is no longer reliable if this charger is gonna shut off at 4.2 and then your cell is gonna come out of the charger at 4.11 or 4.10 because it didn't do that end of charge trickle with constant voltage. So by setting it to 4.25, it comes out of the charger around 4.17 to 4.2, which is exactly how the Opus does it and gives us a good grounds for our testing. So now that the charge has been running for a little bit, you can see the screen is cycling through the cells. So cell four is at 3.67 volts. Cell six is at 3.9 volts. So I'm gonna let this work for a while and then we'll come back and show you some more. Hey guys, so I came out here this morning to check on my cells. After I wrote the capacities on each one, I started pulling them out of the charger and completely forgot that I was supposed to film at the end of this video. So there's only four cells in here because I realized the mistake after I had removed the remainder of the cells. So we're gonna jump over to the computer here. So on the cell data overview screen, uh, they all tested between 2200 and 2300 milliamp hours. And these Sanyo cells are rated for 2200. So these results are as I would expect for a new cell that hasn't been used yet. I did notice an unfortunate limitation of the software though, is that you are supposed to be able to click on the volts and it is supposed to open a grid that shows you the charge that was done during that time. And it appears the grid only shows so many hours of data. So it is currently 11.25 a.m. and the furthest back this is gonna go is to 7.25 a.m. That's kind of unfortunate because these cells have been in this charger since last night and I can't see how they actually finished last night. All right, so my final thoughts and first impressions on this charger. I really like the hardware. I love that you can get 16 cells in this small of a profile uh, instead of having four separate Opus chargers flopping around. I have no complaints whatsoever about the hardware. However, the software does need a lot of work, to be honest. Uh, the impression it gives is that the framework is very old that was used to build it, uh, and it's not really very user-friendly. However, the good thing I discovered about this charger is that you can access the charger directly, and it does put out cell data in JSON format, and it does take uh, JSON-based post requests. So I'm going to look into what I can do to set up my own page to monitor and control the basic functions that I want to use this for without having to use the Megacell charger software. At this point in time, they've already reached their goal uh, for the campaign, so this will be getting produced in mass production. You can still pre-order some if you'd like to. I'm going to leave a link in the description below if you want to head over there and donate to their campaign. It's still got two or three days left, I believe, uh, until they're going to wrap it up, but they are still accepting pre-orders, and those pre-orders are supposed to ship April 
according to their web page. So if this continues going well, I'm definitely gonna order some more of these and may even look into replacing my opuses because being able to access the data through my computer is a big win for me, especially since I don't have to use their software. I can write my own commands against it. I can write my own charting against it, my own database storage, everything. So, so yeah, even if you're not interested in ordering one, I definitely recommend checking it out. Thanks for watching. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them in the description below. If there's anything you'd like me to test on this charger or show more details of, uh, please let me know that as well.